Christopher DiCarlo is an outspoken activist for free thought, humanism, and secularism. He's a fellow advisor and board member of Centre for Inquiry Canada, a fellow of the Society of Ontario Freethinkers, board advisor to Free Thought TV, and a past visiting research scholar at Harvard University Department of Anthropology and the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. <sighs> and he's also a really nice guy. Please welcome Dr. Christopher DiCarlo. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, first thing I'd like to do is, is to thank uh, Bill and Kathy and the organizers and the volunteers for for putting on such a wonderful conference again uh, this year. So I'm very much appreciative of that. And what I've been noticing this year is that obviously with the theme of the conference, the concept of imagine no religion, and we ask ourselves, well, why would we imagine no religion? Of course, we have recognized in our lives and elsewhere in the world that religious beliefs can and often do stand in the way of human progress, of development, and can stifle the very uh, nature of our humanity and curtail our rights and freedoms. Now, what are the alternatives to religion? Well, I think many, many ideas have come forward throughout human history and the history of ideas. One example, of course, a very good one, the, the Renaissance, or the reawakening from the Dark Ages and the Enlightenment and the ages where hu humans began to see information in a whole new way rather than a top-down approach from a divinity. It was a kind of a bottom-up from humanity. And I think this changed the history of ideas uh, forever. And the reason why is because, as Francis Bacon saw during the Renaissance, knowledge is power. And it has the power to allow us to control aspects of our world, to better understand it, and, to, and, and, and in so doing, to make a better world uh, for ourselves and for others as well. And knowledge gives us control and a deliverance from fear and ignorance. And these are the types of things that can really stifle the development of humanity. And so what I'm going to talk to you today is about knowledge as information. And I've developed a system that's called the OzTalk Project. And it's a new way of looking at information that I hope is not only going to be helpful to us as secularists, as humanists, as skeptics and atheists, but is helpful to various walks of life and various ways in which we develop and manage human and natural resources. So to begin, I want to ask you about information in general. How do you get it? How reliable is it? Do you, do you get your information from Fox News? Which, of course, as you know, is fair and balanced. <laughs> do, you, do you lean forward with MSNBC? Do you go to Al Jazeera? One third of uh, people in, in the US now use The Daily Show and The Colbert Report as a way in which they get their information from the news. That, that this is a, these are comedy shows, but they've become so good at what they do, that they've become reliable. They're very good at what they do. They're very good at demonstrating how people will say one thing and act another. And they have great writers and they have great staff. Now, how trustworthy is the information we get through the media from the government, from so-called experts? <laughs> Tide goes in. So, we have many different so-called experts, and the idea is essentially how, how do we basically get information to develop current social policies, laws, uh, when bills go through government. We want to develop these, and we need, I think, a more comprehensive approach to what we now have, and that's what I'm going to present to you today. So, in defining social policies, there are different ways in which we can do this. It can be defined broadly to include income support, seniors' benefits, unemployment insurance, tax credits, and so on and so forth, uh, social housing, social services. It's really the responsible management of human and natural resources. So, 
what do we mean by responsible? How do we know what is responsible in, in the development of these types of policies? So, what we want to do is understand that our current system has deficiencies. They often lack in, 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 in scope and depth. This is an optical illusion. If you stare at it long enough, it'll, it'll move. <laughs> so I think the scope and depth of current manners of, of developing social policies is somewhat lacking. So why? Why are they lacking? Well, because we're using old and accepted methodologies, the status quo, we don't want to rock the boat too much. We have personal biases. There's no way of getting away from personal biases. It's impossible to have bias-free information, and we all know that. So what we might want to do is try to identify how those biases come about and account for it in order to develop ways that are fairer or the most fair we can get for all concerned. And that's an interesting term because many people only like so much fairness in their lives. And as long as it benefits themselves, it's fair. So we have to be careful when we're talking about and throwing around terms like fairness. That's why it's so important, counter to Lawrence Krauss's views of philosophers, to actually have philosophers on hand to discuss ideas. Like, well, what is fairness, right? So heuristics, heuristics are like shortcuts. Well, we can, we can get by by doing it this way. Some of you may have been in different parts of the world and you've experienced ways in which people have done things and you said, well, why do you do that? Well, that's the way we've always done it. Right? So we have a certain kind of dogma that we're facing that this is the way things are done, this is how it gets done, and this is the way it's going to continue to get done. There are personal, private, and political agendas in every form of organization you can imagine. From government and parliamentary hearings to running a porn shop, you're going to have private little political agendas everywhere you go. So we have to be wary of that and identify that. And then there's ignorance, that we just don't know as much as we possibly could, but we're, it's an ongoing process. We're developing more and more knowledge and information about uh, the way the world works and so on and so forth. So these policies may initially be uh, well-meaning, but they can still be lacking in some regard. Now, I'm going to give you a couple examples of experiences in my life where situations have occurred that could require a better, a better model for information. That's why I'm, I'm introducing this OzTalk model for what I call three-dimensional information mining. Now, the first one involves my hometown and the Guelph General Hospital, and it involves uh, the, the aspect of health. Now, in the summer of 2011, there was a C. difficile outbreak. I don't know if you've experienced this in your hometowns, in hospitals. Um, what happens is a bacterium develops. It uh, can hurt the severely compromised, those with severely compromised immune systems, and so on and so forth. It's very, uh, it can be very deadly, very damaging. And so their policies and solutions were to isolate and quarantine the, in the infected patients, which is obviously a good idea, treat them with effective antibiotics, use hand sanitizer for visitors, right? You come into the hospital, oh, hello, you're visiting today? There you go. So there are problems with this approach that my wife and I saw. Uh, her mother was in the hospital at the time in ICU while the C. difficile breakout was happening in the summer of 2011. So right away we noticed some problems. And some of those included, well, where did the bacterium originate? How did it get into the hospital? And why does it get into the hospital? Is hand sanitizer enough? So you go in, you get your hands squirted, but you've just walked across a parking lot, right? And you've just walked in all kinds of things, and really, they, you know, if this is going to be the solution, they should literally just be hosing you down, right? And you should be dripping with alcohol walking into a room. But we know we can't do that, so this is, this is kind of, the, you know, I guess the, the next best thing or the next best approach that they, they think, right? What about your clothes? What about your shoes and those types of things? How does it get transmitted? Nurses, doctors, staff, visitors? 
And it's, I think the solution is to include more pieces of the pie. And, and this will involve what I call the OzTalk project, and I'll, I'll define that more in just a few minutes. The second example I want to talk to you about is the idea of, uh, it involves education. And at a particular university, there was a criminology faculty, and they, they were specialists in a particular type of criminology. I don't know if you're familiar. It's called critical criminology. And I said, well, what's that? I was a new faculty member. And I thought, critical criminology? I, treat, I, I teach critical thinking. So critical criminology probably marries the best of critical thinking with criminology to be able to come up with the best model and understanding for why crime occurs. And then can go about to try to influence and develop policies to look at crime and deal with crime in this kind of positive educational manner. So I said, what, what is it? It's a Marxist feminist postmodernist approach to understanding crime. <laughs> and I thought, okay. That's a male dominated patriarchal capitalist system disproportionately creates a class system which forces others into a life of crime. Now, this may be the case. This may be the case. I'm not saying, oh, you, you guys are crazy. You're, what are you doing? This is, you know, this is absurd. What they, they deal with may actually be the case. If, if things were different, right, and they maintain that crime is largely a result of oppression, then maybe, maybe there would be less crime, right? Change the system and you'll reduce crime. I thought, okay, everybody has their biases, everybody has their agendas, they look at things differently, so why would academia be, be any different? So I decided to, to further up on this, and I said, well, there, there, there may be some problems, right? What about other causal factors for crime? Like, you're, you're just limiting it to, you know, essentially a Marxist feminist outlook, but what about other factors? And they said, well, what are you talking about? I said, well, you know, biology, neuropsychology, maybe a person's makeup is such that if there's low serotonin levels or you have a genetic predisp predisposition for producing less serotonin in your brain at certain periods of your life, coupled with a particular environmental atmosphere, maybe those combinations are responsible for uh, deviant behavior or criminal behavior, and so we can look at crime now in a larger context. So I said, what about these types of things? And I kid you not, I literally got the hand. When I asked them, they said, I don't do that evolution stuff. And I said, so how do you, did humans just kind of plop down out of nowhere? Is there no developmental stages throughout evolutionary history where Maybe we can look at the evolutionary sciences to see what makes a human being tick, to try to understand if there are factors in our biology that might contribute to why people have a greater propensity to commit certain crimes. So what happened was, I think more pieces of the pie need to be included. So these are just two examples, health and uh, education and dealing with, with things like crime. Okay, so, right, what is the OzTalk and how is this model going to contribute to the betterment of humanity and other species in developing social policies which allow us to more responsibly manage human and natural resources? It's called the OzTalk as an acronym for the Onion Skin Theory of Knowledge. It's a natural and cultural understanding. It looks at the complexities and constraints, variables and influences within specific contexts is necessary in order to establish a basic agreement on fundamental issues. A natural and cultural understanding considers these complex relationships in terms of systems analysis. I talk about this a bit uh, in my latest book, and I look at systems in terms of natural systems and cultural systems. There are all kinds of both, and I'll, I'll review some of those in just a moment. So relations of natural systems is a way of understanding linear and nonlinear relationships, looking at causal factors discovered in the physical and the social sciences. This allows us to gain a better understanding of causality in an effort to better develop models and policies for the responsible management of human and natural resources. Causality, that's what science does. 
it understands cause and effect relationships of the natural world. So when we understand natural systems and the way in which they interplay with each other, we're getting a better understanding of what's going on in our natural world. I've developed a website called the relations of natural systems.com where I had a, a funded project for three years and I went to various universities, to various professionals, and I asked them various questions about their disciplines in order to try to get them to understand how things are interconnected and to allow it to be a teaching aid for various university and college uh, professors and for anybody who wants to go online and, and to understand more about how these systems uh, interrelate. And so I talk a bit about biological equilibrium. Every species on this planet, whether you, you know it's, it's a, an amoeba to a zebra and everything in between develops a biological equilibrium. You all now have a particular biological equilibrium. You know rel your relative health based on past episodes and what you anticipate in the future. All animals try to you know, reach this particular kind of equilibrium within their, their ecological niches. So it looks like this. Here is us over here on the left, humanity. And what are we but big, fleshy packages of systems, right? You have a, a skeletal system, you have a muscular system, an endocrine system, respiratory, immune system, nervous system, all of these various types of systems within you operating at any given time. And if something is disruptive in any way to those systems, it can affect your biological equilibrium, and then you wish to do something about it. You want to be you want to return back to that equilibrium. If we break down each system into its component parts, we look at how it goes into the smaller and smaller realms, from the cellular level inside the cell to the molecular level, looking at large molecules like DNA and RNA strands. We know that those are made up of smaller components or bits. And we realize that once we break the bits down, and they contain smaller units, quarks, and so on and so forth. And at, at, at uh, the Large Hadron Collider now, they're looking you know, for the Higgs boson. And it gets into the, the theoretical realm of either quantum loop gravity theory or superstring theory. It gets so that perhaps underlying everything, including you and me and this table and everything else in the universe, might be made up of these vibrating types of strings. Now, there are competing schools of thought between quantum loop gravitational people and superstring theory. But again, this shows the robustness of science and how these ideas get, get tossed around and, and considered and hopefully uh, experiments can be developed in order to test their, their various hypotheses. So our systems are made up of tinier and tinier and tinier and tinier bits. As we function within the world, when we go through larger systems like local ecological systems and larger ecological systems, we come to the entire world, which is a collection of ecosystems. We can talk about weather patterns. We can talk about global warming. We can talk about all kinds of different systems in different ways. There are a solar system in which our planet is one of eight since we kicked out Pluto. And um, we, these planets revolve around a single star we call the sun, which is a part of a large collection of a system we call a galaxy. And then this galaxy is just one of many in a galaxy cluster, which is another system. And this represents uh, all space time. And the reason why I developed this was because I wanted to give my students, in a single glance, their relationship to everything we can imagine up until this point in time and the way in which science looks at causality on all of these different levels. And this is us, but it could have just as easily been a rock or a tree or a shrew or anything else. But it is us. And when we understand us, like science can look at so many other things, we understand ourselves as physical matter, as physical beings that function according to laws and principles and, and activities that can be understood in various ways through mathematical algorithms, through science, through many other ways. And so if we understand better the relationship between these physical systems, we can understand what better our place is on this planet. Now, there is also the relations of cultural systems. Family, ethnicity, education, 
economics, politics, health, medicine, sports, transportation, i.e. lots and lots of what Richard Dawkins calls memes, things that we invent, cultural stuff. So human artifacts, stuff, things, ideas, your hairstyle, uh, the way you brush your teeth, the type of music you listen to, um, whether you prefer um, Britney Spears over Lady Gaga. I mean, there's all kinds of memes out there. Humans interact according to the many complex relationships of these varying cultural systems. And so just as we have a mimetic equilibrium, uh, a biological equilibrium, it would follow that since we have so much stuff in our world, so much stuff in our lives, we develop a mimetic equilibrium. One of the things uh, I was talking to Matt about before our debate is when people like us present counter information to a religious person's worldview, you must understand that what is going on is we are upsetting their mimetic equilibrium. We're upsetting their comfort zone. Most of my work that I did at Harvard involves the neural transmission uh, activities in religious belief. A religious person gets high on their belief. So do scientists. But when a person, a religious person, wakes up in the morning, they've got all the big five covered. They know what they can know. They know why they're here. They know what they are. They know how to behave. And they know what will come of them if they behave in particular ways. And as long as everything is kind of chugging along fairly well, they maintain the mimetic equilibrium. They maintain this kind of high. Once somebody comes along and you know, casts a bit of doubt through uh, logical argumentation, sometimes a crisis of, of faith that can't be reconciled, there are many different ways. The mimetic equilibrium can be disrupted. Some people develop new ones. Some people abandon certain types of religious faith and develop a more kind of naturalistic world out view. And they develop a new mimetic equilibrium. Some don't. Some don't like to have this disrupted. And we need to be aware of that. Um, because when we're having discussions with these people, they, it's like you're taking the bottle from the alcoholic, right? Or the needle from the heroin addict. They don't want you to do that. They want to get back to that comfort zone. They want to be high. They want to be content and happy again. So this is what's happening culture. We have uh, many different types of memes that we have developed and invented and even ideas that we've come up with about the world. And so we develop a mimetic equilibrium. Relations of cultural systems, again, if this is us, we have family, ethnicity, education, economics, politics. We have morality, we have religion, agriculture, industry, law, health, medicine, sports, transportation, communication, the arts, many different factors in our, in our world, and we all needed to rely on these to some degree to even come together and have this particular conference. So what I've done is I've married the two systems, the relations of natural systems and the relations of cultural systems, and I've developed a metaphor that's been used throughout time, this notion of an onion to understand how complex these two types of systems intertwine and affect all of our lives every day. There are physical constraints on us through natural systems. There are cultural constraints on us, right? Physical constraints. Some of us uh, arrived here through flight and motor vehicle, transportation. Well, why didn't my wife Linda and I just start flapping our arms in Guelph to get here? Because we're bounded by constraints, physical constraints. And then there are various cultural constraints as well. Um, essentially going through um, security at an airport. You have to take your shoes off, take your belt off, that sort of thing. So plenty of different types of systems intertwine into this very complex ball I call the onion skin theory of knowledge. So it's extremely complex. How complex is it? Well, let's ask Orville DeLong, the gentleman on the left here. This is a meteorologist here. And this is Orville DeLong on the left. He's a friend of my cousin's in Cambridge, Ontario. Interesting guy, Orv. I mention him in the book. Within a span of a few years, three things happen to Mr. DeLong. 
He was in a severe car accident which put him into the hospital for five and a half months while he recovered. After surviving that and getting out and golfing one day in the Dune Valley Golf Course near Kitchener, Ontario, he was struck by lightning. <laughs> and, he su and he survived. Shortly after that, he was golfing on the golf course, and that meteorite nearly hit him in the head. <laughs> he has since had a colonoscopy and had all the horseshoes removed. <laughs> Just more pain he had to endure. Now, during the debate, a question was asked to me about how do you explain why we're here, and so on and so forth. And I gave the one word answer. Do you remember what it was? Luck. Man, is this guy lucky. <laughs> but let's think about it for a second. Let's think about how complex this really is. That rock is millions, perhaps billions of years old. It was flying around space. And when our planet moved through an area in which it was traveling through space, it came through our atmosphere, did not burn up, and nearly hit this guy in the head. <laughs> Think of his life that put him in that position at that exact point in time for all of those complex things to have led him to be four feet away from this thing. That's how high it went over his head. That's what we need to think about in terms of complexity, of how incredibly complex our lives are at any given time. At any given time, this is how complex our lives are on this planet, in this part of the universe, which is immense. So, I met Orif and I talked to him and I interviewed him and he showed me the, the copy of the, the meteorite and whatnot. Uh, fascinating. But again, a great way of, of understanding how complex the relationships are between natural and cultural systems. What if he had decided not to tie his golf shoes up in a particular way that day and took less time? He'd be dead, right? What if he had missed a bus earlier in his life? He might never have been there at all and would have read about it in the newspaper. So this is how we need to think in terms of the complexity of the world around us. Very, very complex. And interestingly enough, we have evolved to the point where we can start to see these complexities. We may never understand them all because the vastness of the complexities, but at least we can appreciate what our positions are while we're alive on this, on this particular planet. This means that we and every other species on this planet are system manipulators. We manipulate systems all the time various ways in which you're going to be healthy, various ways in which you're going to try to get the types of things that you value in life, whatever that happens to be. Hey, I got tickets in the front row to the Eagles concert. How come? Because I'm an American Express card holder. Right? You've manipulated a system and been able to get the types of things that you value in life. Hey, I got an A plus on my biology exam. Really? How'd you do it? I cheated. <laughs> I manipulated the system. All kinds of ways to manipulate systems. Some we can discuss more ethical than others. Now, the system manipulator, or us, we exploit the constraints in the onion skin theory of knowledge in light of what we perceive to be valuable. So we act in ways, we are directed in ways that we find to be valuable, whatever that happens to be. The relationship between the onion skin layers of causal constraints, we know, is extremely complex. So what we can do is we can use the onion as a metaphor and a model to be able to try to understand how deep we can go into the onion on a specific topic. My understanding of quantum physics, I'm going a couple of layers into the onion. Once you start talking math, bye-bye. That's it. I'm sorry, I don't have the capacity for understanding quantum physics at that level. Lawrence Krauss goes deeper into the onion. You can also talk, though, about how far around the onion our knowledge of various aspects of this world 
branch out and affect and touch and influence those other aspects. So this is why I think the, the onion is a great model for understanding information. You can talk about depth of knowledge and breadth of knowledge as well. We cannot know all of the influences of all of the constraints at any time. We're not omniscient beings, but we can understand what I call causal clusters. And many popular works do consider how we can understand these complex systems. Uh, heard of Freakonomics, uh, Levitt, Dunner, The Drunkard's Walk. I would highly recommend this book. It's an excellent book, one of the best books I've ever read. Um, just remarkable book, especially if you're interested in the, the concept of free will. Very, very good book. Sway by Orion Ram Brofman and Connected by uh, Christakis and Fowler. These are very popular books, but they, they deal with fairly complex issues in a very, very interesting manner. In fact, a lot of these people have done TED Talks, so you can probably find them online discussing them in, in some way. So there's plenty of work being done looking at complex systems and the way in which uh, humans interact at, at varying levels. And there are dozens of organizations that deal with complexities in systems, and I mean dozens of organizations. New England Complex Systems Institute, the Santa, you might have heard of the Santa Fe Institute, Northwestern Institute, I mean there's so many different ones. Southampton, uh, University of Michigan, Kent State, Complex Systems and Brain Sciences at, at FAU, Florida Atlantic. So there are plenty of places that are looking at aspects of our uh, lives that affect us in specific ways and considering uh, our lives in accordance with the way in which I basically described the onion skin theory of knowledge. So incredibly complex networks of information exist thanks to the internet and other systems. And how will the Aztec contribute to more responsible development and management of, of, of human and natural resources. I think the more we can understand these constraints and the complex network, the more comprehensive models we're going to be able to develop to make more responsible policies. And what do we mean by more responsible? Well, those that are fair or fairer than the ones that currently exist now. So let's go back to our first two examples. General Hospital, C. facile. One of the things I would do with the Oz talk, if I were brought to the table, so to speak, and I were meeting with officials within the hospital, is I would say, okay, so why does this bacterium, why does C. difficile, why does it exist in the first place? What is it? Tell me as much about this bacterium as you can. Okay, in order to do that, we better bring in the microbi microbiologists and geneticists. Get them in here, because they need a seat at the table. How does it move through societies? How does the disease transfer? Epidemiologists, take a chair. How has it been dealt with in the past? Medical historians, what about bioethical issues? Hey, philosophers get jobs. So, <laughs> so it's really just a make work project for me. That's <laughs> all it is. How is the hospital sanitized, right? What's the current protocol right now? How long has this protocol been implemented. So we need somebody to do a meta-analysis. Somebody will be able to say, here are the facts. This is the way we've done things. Why do you do it? Oh, we've always done it that way. I found out that Guelph General Hospital has used the same sanitizer for the last seven years. If you know anything about microbiology, you will realize that when you introduce a new constraint within microbial ecology, like um, antibacterial soap. I remember when antibacterial soap first came out. Uh, by the way, where's my soapbox? There it is. So um, antimicrobial uh, soap comes out. It's antibacterial stuff. And I see an advertisement for it. And it's made by the good people at Johnson & Johnson. So I call them up. And I say, antibacterial soap. Isn't soap by nature antibacterial? Isn't the reason you use soap is to get stuff like that off your hands? Oh, but no, sir. This has triclosan. I said, oh, what is that? Exactly. What is triclosan? Oh, it's a chemical that better kills, you know, salmonella and certain other types of, of, of germs and things like that. I said, oh, oh, interesting. What happens to the triclosan? Like when you wash it away, does it, does it get filtered out 
when it goes through you know, water purification and that, that sort of thing somewhere down the line, it's somebody's job in the city to do, oh yes, it's entirely biodegradable. They've now found out it's not biodegradable. And what happens is when you introduce triclosan into, into a microbial uh, ecology, there's, there's got to be elbow room. What's going to happen is it's going to kill 99.9% of the germs. You will actually see this advertised in commercials and on the packaging. If that's the question, if that's the issue then, it only kills 99.9% of the, of the germs and whatnot, then the point one that survive, if they replicate, if the mutants, the freaks, of which we are all freaks, um, because we mutated and we survived, but if these mutants and freaks survive and replicate, you can throw all the triclosan at these things you want in the future. It's not going to have any effect on them. So essentially what we're doing when we use antibacterial soap is we're creating an environment that's just nice for the mutants and the freaks to win, <laughs> which are going to come back and affect, if not us, then our children. If not our children, then our grandchildren. And it's happening right now. But in order to realize this, you have to understand systems and the way in which systems interact at this very complex level. So I remember being in, in we have Zare's grocery stores in Ontario, and I was doing the shopping, and I was trying to buy soap, hand soap, that didn't have antibacterial components in it. It's hard, you can maybe get, I think, Dove or Ivory, but I'm looking, I'm looking, and the manager comes by and I say, excuse me, do you have anything here that doesn't have antibacterial? Oh, why, why? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> I'm a professional pain in the ass. <laughs> Don't try this at home unless you purchase my book. No. The idea, and I explained to him what I've just told you, people started gathering around with their carts and saying, what? What's this? And they started to ask this, this store manager more and more questions. And he said, hey, guys, <laughs> I don't know anything about this stuff. I, I just give the product up to the people because I think that that's just what you want. And I, and I tried to tell the guy, I'm not blaming you. I don't expect you to have a degree in microbiology or to know or to understand how things operate, but you, I'm just going to give you the heads up that this, this is what's going on. And I called Johnson & Johnson back and I said, look, don't you realize what's happening with this? They really didn't care about what I had to say. I said, look, we are delivering a supply that is being demanded by the public. The public wants to be cleaner. And I said, yeah, but the public only thinks they know what is best for them. Scientists know really what's going on in this regard. So sometimes we have to influence the development of activities, whether it's private or public, in a way in which we are better informed so we can handle these types of things when they come up. Now, what cleaning agents are specifically being used at the hospital, where, and how often? So the cleaning staff, you're invited to the meeting because you're very important. We need to find out what's going on. Why are those particular cleaning agents being used? Okay, so we need to bring in somebody from HR because they're the ones who have to do the budget. They have to come in either under budget or not so much over budget. And they have a lot of pressure on them as well. Have they ever been replaced or switched? If so, when? If not, why not? And then we get the microbiologists and the geneticists to then explain what goes on in microbial ecologies. And then now everybody's on the same page. Right? So why or why not? Let's bring in the doctors. <laughs> Stethoscope. Stethoscopes were always made of metal. At one point, silver was used. Why silver? Because silver is naturally antimicrobial. Very difficult, believe it or not. Bacteria to live on silver objects. Silverware doesn't affect the taste of the food. Okay. Stethoscopes now, the last bioethics conference I spoke at, they had huge displays of various types of medical equipment from uh, blood pressure cuffs to stethoscopes to surgical instruments, all kinds of, of different types of, of products. And I went up to the stethoscope display and they were all made of uh, uh, high carbon fiber type. And I said, oh, that's interesting. So are these antimicrobial? Like I said, what, what, what do you mean? I said, so 
is the content of this kind of carbon fiber plastic here, does it resist um, uh, bacteria and viruses and things like that? We, I don't know. I said, but you're selling these to doctors, right? And they're going from patient to patient. Yep. So then you have a, a cleaning solution. You've got some way of figuring out how when he goes to one patient and she goes to another patient and they go back to another patient and whatnot, you, you wipe them with something. No. Okay, so then, let me get this straight. You're encouraging the spread of disease. Have you let any of the epidemiologists know that this is what you're doing? And he said, you know, that's a good idea. We could come out with a cleanser. This guy's thinking marketing. Now he's thinking, not only can we sell the stethoscopes, but you want to use this cleanser, right? So he's thinking business. And I'm thinking, you know, health. You're a doctor, right? Damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a busboy. <laughs> you need to clean your hands. You're going to touch my kid's throat. And if that kid has strep throat, and you walk out of here and grab your pen and do all this, whatnot, and you go into that next patient, which I'm pretty sure you're going to do, and touch that person, streptococcus has now moved throughout that clinic. The doctor reluctantly washed his hands through the tollway, looked at me and said, is that good enough? Some doctors have, um, they suffer from, from HUAS, <laughs> head up ass syndrome. <laughs> and they're not the only ones. They're not the only ones. Some doctors, our pediatrician, she's amazing. She's very cognizant of germ transmission and because she's aware of it. And the last thing she wants to do is to see a toddler or an infant or whatnot, and that child is very sick with fever and so on, you know, and then goes and gives it to the next one. She is very good. At, at understanding the transmission of, of disease and germs, bacteria, and viruses. But some, and it's usually the older doctors, they, they think they're somehow made of silver or something. I don't know. That they, they, it can't be me. I'm not, I'm not doing this. They are, without question, they are the number one transmitters of disease in hospitals. There's plenty of studies to do this. Nurses are second. And it's not as though they want to do this. It's that we don't have a better understanding of the models involved, of the systems that are at work here. So, so nurses have biases, they have heuristics, ways of doing things, how to go from patient to patient interaction. Is this the best way to do your job? I don't want to tell you how to do your job, but I do want to observe how you do your job and, and look at ways in which maybe we can increase likelihood that we're called, we will curtail the spread of disease, especially if there's something like C. difficile in a hospital. And HR, they have a very difficult job. They are the least respected in hospitals, but they have a very difficult job because they, they are the ones who are paying for all this stuff. And they are the ones who will say, sure, we got unlimited money. Yeah, we can do just about anything we want, but how are we going to do this within budget? So all of these systems have to come together and work in coordination in order to combat a particular type of problem that we see within a given collective of systems. In the case of critical criminology, we need to recognize limitations of the current model. That is to say, is a Marxist feminist model complete enough to give us you know, appropriate information about crime? Because don't forget, criminologists do influence the way in which bills are passed, the way in which laws come into being and whatnot. They, they don't just teach in, in theoretical realms. They do have applications within the real world in terms of dealing with crime. I think we need to expand the model. We don't have to chuck it out, but I do think we need to expand it. We need to include other relevant factors. I belong to an organization called SEAL, the Society for the Evolutionary Analysis of Law, and we look at biological, psychological, and neuropsychological factors of why people might commit certain types of crimes, and then how do we determine punishments? based on that person's particular disposition. And to me, this is the future of law and crime. The better we understand systems at the physical and natural level and at the cultural level, and we bring these together, the fairer we will be in determining what type of punishment best fits that crime. So certain types of crimes can be committed in ways where it will be beyond a person's capability. And we need to be able to understand that. As heinous as the crime might be, 
we need to understand the collective of influences on a given person at a given time for committing the crime. That's not to say we just say, oh, you shouldn't have done that. We realize, you know, these things happen. Go on your way. We need to protect ourselves and protect others, but we can do it in a more compassionate and in a better manner for all concerned. I don't know if you realize this, but up until about six years ago, uh, the state of Texas, uh, Matt, you might be able to tell us more about this, I, I believe they still had capital punishment on, on those who were, were, were mentally handicapped. That the fact of the matter was, I'm sorry, you committed the crime. You are responsible for that. And this often uses an antiquated model known as a dualism or a dualistic model, that there's this kind of pilot in the ship that's responsible for, for actions, a soul, if you will. And much of today's law believes that you are fully and always in control of your actions at any given time. And so you, whatever your soul is, that's what's accountable for your behavior. But what's happening is science is further and further discovering that there may be no pilot in the ship. There's just the ship. We're the ship. And the ship functions according to all of these varying constraints within this complex interplay of natural and cultural systems. So we have to come up with a fairer, a better way of managing humans and natural resources. So I think we need to acknowledge biases. It's very difficult for academics to do this because they're always right. <laughs> and it's difficult for others, right? Because they can be mostly misguided, right? Don't do that evolution stuff. So what's the bottom line? Bottom line is, the more comprehensive the model regarding the constraints of this world, the better enabled we will be in developing responsible social policies for managing human and natural resources. But this is going to take a great deal of time. Patience, organization, and dedication. And it's not going to be easy. And more than likely, it's probably not going to be cheap, but if you think about it, in the long run, it will save enormous amounts of money because we will know more about the constraints under which humans behave and humans act. So in doing some shameless self-promotion, I am seeking philanthropic interest to support this very project. And uh, the onion skin theory at yahoo.com is the email at which I can be reached for this particular type of uh, project. It's currently associated with a not-for-profit, a group I'm a, a fellow of, the Society for Ontario Free Thinkers. And uh, I'm interested in, in attaining seed money from pr private philanthropi uh, 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 philanthropic interest, foundations, governments, and that sort of thing. I've already generated some interest, and I'm currently interested in seeking out people uh, like Mr. Uh, Balsley. Uh, he's one of the, the co-founders of, of RIM and, and the Blackberry. He just lives in Waterloo, which is very close to Guelph, Ontario. And I think this is the type of project that anybody who has the capacity to care for humanity and for other species would agree, at least in theory and at least in principle, yeah, you're onto something. It's, it's almost as though I'm saying, aren't kittens cute? Right? I, I don't think I'm saying anything overly controversial other than we can do better with what we currently have. Because if you think about it, if we can understand information in this kind of onion skin theory model, then we will be able to do what I call three-dimensional data mining. Not just the depth of information, but the breadth of information as well. So we can solve problems by understanding the ways in which there are complex interactions within those causal clusters. I think this is what will lead to a betterment of humanity and a betterment for other species as well. So it's to be used as a tool, and at the, this point, as an open source tool, tool that anybody can access we can get information in, yes, as fair and balanced a manner as possible. The Oztalk project is intended to act kind of like a consumer's report for responsibly attained information. So when a bill comes through and it goes to the Senate and the commission is, is struck and they need to investigate certain aspects related to this bill, uh, the one I'm very interested uh, in is, well, you can, you can consider a number, but Think of the concept of, of uh, homosexuality. Science can uh, pretty much demonstrate and has been able to demonstrate 
that homosexuality is not a life choice, it's biologically and neurologically based. What we can do is to demonstrate that there are uh, enormous groups of people throughout the world who know this and can demonstrate this. How then can anybody have a moral opinion about what is a natural phenomenon? This is to commit what's called the naturalistic fallacy. So then what we can demonstrate is that there is overwhelming evidence for why policies that were previously unfair, that is to say same-sex couples should not get married, right, in whatever states in the US or other countries throughout the world, is based on ideological principles, not sound evidence from which projects like this will be able to demonstrate, uncover, and provide. So, it should be reliable, trustworthy, and the system should be wary of inherent biases. Controls will be put in place to monitor and assure this. It can't, the, 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 the OSTOC can't side with any particular political slant. It can't. That's why consumer reports do not get endorsements by any company. They can't. Oh, thank you, Rolex, for the 15 watches. That was very nice. Rolex is the best watch you can buy. <laughs> So it has to be free of bias, it has to be free of influence. That's, of course, if we really want fairness. And if that's the case, then this is what I want to put together. And with the help of groups like this and other groups throughout the world, I don't think it's far from uh, becoming a reality. In today's world, I really do think people want to be able to trust the information they receive. Why is the Colbert Report and The Daily Show so popular? because they present information where you literally cannot just simply deny it. It's in your face, it's there. This person said this, and then said they never said that, and then they bring up the footage of them saying that. <laughs> so it's like, f for you to deny that would to be deny, I don't know, reality. <laughs> so, the Oztalk project is dedicated to providing this so that the social policies and laws can be created, developed in the fairest possible manner. And so now, the really hard work begins. Thank you.